Dobar večer, poštovani dragi gledatelji. Večeras imam dva gosta, dakle imamo tri u jedan, ali je dobro što imam dva gosta, jednog republikanca, jednog demokrata, jer imam redku priliku ugostiti goste iz SAD-a u svome studiju. Večeras su sa mnom gospodin Tobi Mofet, dobro večer, i gospodin Bran Lanza, dobro večer. Hvala na vašem vremenu, hvala što ste došli iz SAD-a u ovu emisiju. Znam da ste posjetili Dubrovnik i kako to već ide u Hrvatskoj. Vas malo muči jet lag, ali proći će to. Nadam se da ćete uživati u Hrvatskoj, no u svakom slučaju imamo dovoljno vremena posvetiti se dijelom samo SAD-u, a malo ćemo razgovarati o svijetu, jer kako razgovarati sa osobama koje dolaze iz SAD-a, ne razgovarati o svijetu. Kad o tome govorim, moram kazati samo gledateljima, moji gosti nisu bilo tko. I jedan i drugi imaju ogromne karijere i u vladi, i u politici, i u PR-u, i u privatnom sektoru. Neću sad sve nabrajati. Dovoljno da kažem da je jedan radio za Trumpa, drugi za Bajdena. Tako da je to najbolja preporuka. Iz prve ruke ćemo čuti ćemo čuti, dakle, o čemu je riječ u SAD-u. Evo, recimo, u ovo predizborno vrijeme počet ćemo sa time tko bi se mogao kandidirati za predsjednika na sljedećim izborima. Najopćenitije pitanje, ali evo, jednog i drugog to pitam. Kakva su vaše očekivanja i kakva su realna očekivanja Amerikanaca? Well, mine is easier, I think, than Brian, because we have a president who would be the candidate if he chose to run. Uh, there would be no question about that. There may be a minor challenge in the primaries here and there, but President Biden would receive the nomination without any doubt. I don't think Brian would argue with that. Uh, the question is, does he run? I'm not entirely sure. If not, um, I can say we Democrats have full confidence that we have a huge bench <laughs> with talented people. Um, could be gov it could be our governor, could be the governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, it could be the governor of Michigan. Could be the vice president. It could be the vice president, uh, Kamala Harris. Um, but we'll know, I think, in the next uh, four to six weeks what's happening on our side. Well, first of all, thank you for having my colleague and I here. We're very honored to appear here. Yeah, listen, I think Republican politics is going to be no different than what it looked like in 2016, which is a bloodbath. Uh, I think you're going to have Republicans attacking each other. You're certainly going to have Trump attacking everybody. It doesn't matter who it is at any point. That's just his M.O. But I think at the end of the day, unless something dramatically happens, i.e. some type of indictment, Trump will be the nominee for the Republican Party. He's sitting at 50 percent in the polls right now. Uh, he, he has a tremendous organization already operating in nearly all 50 states, and he has the advantage. Until somebody beats the king, you're the king. And so I think Trump becomes the nominee until somebody in the party can step up. There's other names, Governor Ron DeSantis, Governor Chris Christie, Governor Greg Abbott. But I think at the end of the day, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is going to be President Trump. I should ask you maybe an incorrect question to you, because you were engaged on one and on the other side, and you have to be a little subjective. But who would be the best candidate in this moment for America, regardless of the events in the world? For each party? Well, first of all, let me say. Yes, yes. But let me say in response to my partner and, and dear friend, we on our side would love for Trump to be the candidate for the Republican <laughs> Party. I'm just not sure it's going to happen. I, in fact, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Is that But, so? but uh, well, I, I just think the guy is is so toxic in his own party, increasingly, mm -hmm. that people want to be done with him. And you see signs of that all over the place. The election controversy, scandal, whatever. Now we have Fox News, which is by far the biggest news organization, reaches more tens and tens of millions of people, admitting in court that they didn't believe the election was stolen, but they still told their viewers because they were afraid their viewers would leave them. So there's just so much baggage around him. I personally, because I want us to win, I want, I believe in the Democratic Party, I would be fearful of Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, or maybe the same state, Nikki Haley. Um, I don't think uh, your, your friend uh, Sununu yeah. and, and my Lebanese cousin, <laughs> Sununu, the yeah. governor of uh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire. Uh, can win the nomination, but he would be 
hugely formidable. I think you would agree. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I, listen, I, I, I think from our standpoint, you know, Toby is right. You know, f Governor Sununu from New Hampshire, very formidable, doesn't have a real chance of winning the primary. And if he were to run, nobody would campaign in New Hampshire. Exactly. Which is a problem for the, the, the structure. But I think, That's you know, Toby, Toby's right. I think if you go sort of the next phase, you know, we have some strong candidates there, whether it's DeSantis or whether it's Abbott or whether even Chris Christie comes back or Rick Scott, or Tim Scott, who, mm -hmm. who could be very formidable. Uh, but I think from our standpoint, you ask, who do we want to run against? We'd love to run against Kamala Harris. Trump, Trump Donald Trump no. would beat Kamala Harris today, tomorrow, and any day after. Ali Ja imam jedan prigovor o vašoj tezi da je previše toga što ide sada sa Trumpom što mu oteža situaciju. Znate, tako je bilo i u prvoj kampanji i sve mu je išlo ipak na ruku. Svi ti problemi su zapravo odjednom postali njegov prednost. Not really. This is documented baggage. These are high level judges that some of whom are Trump appointees that have dismissed his assertions and claims in courts all over the country for years, including on the election scandal. No, this is a different kind of baggage. I'm not talking about the business reputational, baggage, yeah. the rep business baggage, the reputational baggage. I'm talking about uh, my friends in the Republican Party, majority of them, when, you th when they think about Trump as the candidate, they, they basically, I'm not speaking for Brian, but they basically take Brian's position. Yes, he could be the nominee, it's likely, but oh my God, we don't want that to happen. They want to be. They want to be done with him. They want to. They want to move on to the next chapters. Vi ste u jednom trenutku kazali da u razgovoru koji privatan da je to što ste malo posjedili za prvo plod tog kratkog mandata koji se ipak čini vama predug i dug. On je bio jako buran i zbog toga svi mi u svijetu, ne da navijamo protiv Trumpa, ali Americi želimo dobro, želimo mir, želimo jednu uravnoteženu situaciju, ne želimo gledati scene kao iz Kongresa. Zumijete, mislim, Amerika je za ostatak svijeta ipak nešto što svi mi manje više budemo iskreni idealiziramo. Gotovo Hollywood. Mi želimo takvu Ameriku i takvu Amerika nam treba. Koliko onda u tom smislu realno da Trump zaista postane ponovno kandidat? Vi spominjete u veliki postotak potpore. I koji je profil ljudi koji u tom velikom broju njega podupiru? Jer znate zašto vas to pitam? Očito da onda postoje dvije Amerike. Well, listen, I would say yes. Uh, and I think, you know, John Edwards, you know, former presidential mm -hmm. candidate on the Democratic side, talked about two Americas. I mean, so that's not nothing new. It's been going there for a while. But, you know, I, I think the important thing to, to sort of remember about Trump is he was always a product of the grassroots of the political party, not the political class, but the everyday person who's not checked into the, to the process. You know, he was sort of the, always their champion, and he spoke to them differently than most Republican donors. He speaks to most Republican donors. So I think the challenge challenge that anybody has who wants to dislodge President Trump is they have to dislodge him with the grassroots. And he's very popular with the grassroots. Donors may not, you know, the establishment may have reservations with him, the donors, they don't want the, the, the chaos that comes with President Trump. But I think the voters, the Republican voters, especially after eight years of Barack Obama at that time, and now four years after Joe Biden, they want somebody who's going to fight. They want somebody who's going to come to Washington, D.C., turn it upside down, break these institutions that they feel have been broken for a very long time, and have it working for the people again. Like, that was the appeal of Trump after, four, after eight years of Barack Obama. I think that appeal still applies. Now, he, Trump has to get through the primary. I think he has a strong chance. The chaos is bad. Don't get me wrong. The, the chaos is, is a result. You know, all this gray hair is a result of, of the chaos that he brings. But uh, I got to tell you, chaos has been a strategy. He has, he was, he's been right about a lot of things even though he's brought a lot of, as Toby says, baggage to, to the frame. But at the end of the day, you know, he knows how to analyze a problem, and he's, he's figured out how to fix it. And I think voters will sort of look at those results and say, this is a different politician. This is a politician that made you know, promises, and he kept them, which is different than most American politicians who constantly break their promises. Well, you know, when you say he knows how to see a problem and fix it, how would he have done on Ukraine with, no. his, with his being a pal, uh, being a pal of Putin? He kept Putin out of Ukraine. Now, it's a good well, thing. It's, you know, listen, we're, we're all here supportive of Ukraine, USA, Croatia, Ukraine. There's, there's that unity that, that takes place. But I think the important thing to remember is you know, President Putin 
attacked Russia during Barack Obama's administration, and he attacked Russia during Joe Biden's administration. It's not an accident that he didn't do anything in those four years. I think there was enough chaos that he saw coming from President Trump where he's like, I want no part of this, let me wait it out. And he did. And we've seen those results today. Unfortunately, uh, the, the Ukrainian people are feeling those results. Two questions are here. First, how do you see these two countries in America, which Brian says is about nothing new? Of course, for you, it's a general place, but it's not for us. But how do you see your insider's view of the two countries? It's not just two Americas. There, there, are, there are increasingly massive divisions in de democracies around the world. There's a populist far-right element all over Europe that's clashing with a you know, socialist or formerly socialist. It's happening everywhere. This is a global phenomenon. Part of it is, I think, I mean, we don't want to get too philosophical, but part of it is uh, a disappointment with what capitalism has delivered. And, you know, we're seeing, you see it here. I, I'm not a Croatian expert, but you see it in the former Yugoslavia, this tugging and pulling between former socialist tendencies and free enterprise. And so, and how much regulation will there be? So in our, in our society, I grew up on an estate where my father was the caretaker. I lived in the servants' quarters with the Japanese butler and the German maid and so forth. And I remember vividly, this was in northern Connecticut, very rural, 500 acres, we say, estate. And I remember that town. Very Republican town. Republicans ran everything. They ran the schools, they ran the local government, they ran the library, they ran the churches. We looked up to them. They were cultured, they were more international, more global, more educated. Guess what? None of their children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren are Republicans today. They were run out of the party in favor of a more uneducated, uh, working, white working class, bitter, um, very disappointed uh, people in the system. And starting with Nixon's Southern strategy in 1968, the party has increasingly moved to adopt them. And that's what Fox News is really all about, if you look at their viewership. So that's the two Americas. I mean, it's just, that's what we have, for, for better or worse. And on our side, we tend to have more coastal, West Coast, East Coast, professionals, college educated, and so we're out of touch with the people that the Republicans in some cases are now connecting with. Kad ste već spomenuli, vratit ćemo se još sa dva pitanja kandidatima i gospodinu Bajdenu i gospodinu Trumpu, ali prethodno spomenuli ste Ukrajinu. Ajmo odmah ovoga i medija sres. I u SAD-u i širom svijeta postoji naravno nepodijeljena podrška ovome što se događa dakle na zapadu a to je unisona potpora Ukrajini u njezini pravodnoj borbi ali kao sjena toga postoje ogromna količina ljudi koji naprosto u tom nekom snaženju protu američkog raspoloženja govore Amerika je to izazvala to je naprosto politika u nadal dva tri predsjednička mandata ne samo Trumpa ni Bajdena nego i Obame prije toga i tako dalje Amerika želi naprosto lansirne rampe pod Moskovlju i tako dalje i tako dalje hoću kazati kako SAD doživljava na neki način stvaranje pa i u Evropi svoje vrstno protu američkog raspoloženja. Ili se to opravdava isključivo i samo djelovanjem ruske propagande? Let me just say, I'll go quickly, bro. Let me just say that we do not have to apologize for opposing Putin's imperialistic aggression. I mean, it's... The country's gone backward when they had a chance to go forward. He's a big part of that, if not the biggest cause of it. At the same time, I understand what you're saying. And it's always easy to go back and sort of second guess, were we too much in their face in 1992, 1993 with NATO expansion? These are all questions that, you know, history will decide. But I, I think it's perfectly fine to discuss them. I think it's perfectly fine, as a matter of fact, to acknowledge the reality that even though Putin's counting on fatigue in America, in Europe, and around the world, he's counting on fatigue, right? There is fatigue. And there's going to be fatigue. And how do we see our way out of this? Is it a Korea uh, 
no armistice, no peace treaty, just forces stand in place? I don't know. But I do think this, like, rah, rah, we're going to fight to the end and the Ukrainians are going to win, is, mm. is I think it's ridiculous because it's not going to happen. Dodgeman toga Bran. To mi spomenuo odgovornost na neki način Trumpa u relaciji, dakle, njegovo i prijateljstvo sa Putinom. Vi ste sudjelovali vrlo intenzivno u toj tranziciji, omogućili zapravo tranziciju i bili ste bliski, dakle, tada predsjedniku. Znate iz prve ruke, mislim, te okolnosti. Kakva je narav tog prijateljstva zapravo? I još jedno pitanje prije toga. Zar je zaista moguće da se u svijetu SAD-u i dan danas raspravlja o tome da je Rusija izabrala Americi predsjednika. Mislim, to je meni komično, groteskno i tako dalje, potpuno neprihvatljivo, ali jedan dio prigovora je u samom SAD-u da ide na račun republikanaca u tom pravcu. Well, I would say the Democrats have said it louder because it serves their partners and purpose. Yeah. You know, Democrats have a history of not acknowledging Republicans' presidential elections. Okay. In 2000, they didn't acknowledge President Bush's. In 2004, they didn't acknowledge President Bush's re-election. In 2016, the, the certain parties in the Democratic Party didn't acknowledge you know, Donald Trump's victory. I think that's normal. But uh, we didn't storm the Capitol. In 2020, you did not, but you almost yeah, stormed the White House. Years. You almost yeah. stormed the White yeah. House. That's why they had to put a secure perimeter and add military to protect it. So you're right. They didn't successfully storm the White House because Trump was smart enough to put a barrier around the White House in Congress. <laughs> they did not have this barrier. But uh, let me say this. You know, there's no friendship between the two. I think... <laughs> of course. Well, we give as good as we get. But I would say there's no friendship with Trump. I think the thing to understand about you know, with Putin and Trump, I think to understand about the relationship between those two is, is, is Trump is very much an anti-war interventionist, you know, different from the, the normal Republican Party who has this military pro hoc. And I think he made the decision early on that he did not want to have any type of you know, engagement like Obama did with, uh, with Crimea and, and Ukraine and Russia, that he would just sort of you know, do the rhetoric that just kept Putin at bay. That's my theory. He's never said it to me, but I've never noticed a friendship. And if you, you sort of look at the things, let's look at Syria. You know, President Trump ordered you know, a military strike in Syria that killed 300 Russians. That, to me, does not sound like Putin's best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, when Putin entered you know, Crimea, Barack Obama didn't do anything. Next to nothing, I think that's fair to say. So, you know, it's, it's, I get the politics of saying, you know, the Russians, you know, elected President Trump, at least the Democrats say it, the Russians elected President Trump. I mean, some of them are being elected to higher office, where they said there was clear evidence of Russian collusion, and yet the facts came out completely different. But I, I think when you look at this is, a lot of it's promulgated in the U.S. by partisan politics, that's something that exists there. But you just have to, you have to look at the data. I mean, during, while President Trump was president, he was very hard on Russia. He killed 300 Russians you know, in Syria. He did all these other things that sort of counter what you think is the friendship. Uh, but my guess is he, he quickly realized, which also goes to the engagement of North Korea, because Barack, Barack Obama told him that would be a serious threat, is he sought these guys out to avoid conflict. Because why else would you seek out any type of friendship with the president of North Korea? Da, da, da. Or a president other than to avoid some type of conflict in the future. And that's a different thinking to, from to, an American to, president. Da, to je bilo karakteristično za Obamu da je izbjegavao taj konflikt. Koji je očito bio neizbježan, mislim, ili se barem sad tako post festom čini. Uh, jedno pitanje koje će imati zapravo dva dijela. Uh, nismo nijednu riječ rekli o tome, je li gospodin predsjednik Biden... Uh, uopće raspoložen, da to tako kažem, eufemizmom, da se ponovno kandidira i je li realno da se on kandidira. I s jedna tog pitanja je, ako netko drugi dođe u bijelu kuću, bez obzira tko, hoće li se promijeniti politika prema Ukrajini? If another person? Ja. I think the facts on the ground and the fatigue that I mentioned are going to change the policy over time. I think it'll, it'll take time. Uh, and I'm sure you weren't suggesting that, that uh, Biden should go in now and rescue Crimea no, from the Russians. No, no, I'm not. No. Well, that, that's, that's, that's Zelensky's issue to do. But No, I know, but... Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't suggest he, that. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I just have to get... We have to make one thing clear about Brian. He blamed the, his gray hair on Trump, but he has... Young children, too, so... <laughs> it it's all not, came at the same time. It's not all Trump's fault, okay? <laughs> on the, on yeah. the yeah. yeah, so, so here's the thing about... <laughs> not your, on your question. Um, 
I think that Biden's outlook is that he's been a very activist president. It can be argued that he's more consequential or as consequential as FDR and as Lyndon Johnson, the two presidents that had the biggest legislative achievements, whether you like them or not, in terms of performance as a president, getting big packages of things through, confronting the climate crisis when the other party didn't give you one vote and they were in climate denial. Uh, understanding that America's infrastructure is totally broken. It's back in the 30s and 40s, and we need to modernize. These are all parts of his legacy. And I think if he runs again, he'll have a story to tell. My concern, as somebody who served with him in the Congress, and as somebody who loves Joe Biden as a person, admires him more than anything, and as someone who thinks he's been a great president, the last three elections, including presidential and midterms, we have dominated the two youngest generations of voters. Uh -huh. We have dominated those generations of voters, tens of millions of people, don't necessarily want Joe Biden to run again. I think that's something that our party's not talking about. Brian, I see that you want something to add. Yeah, you know, listen, it's, it's you know, the... the the young people, you know, Barack Obama did a good job of getting them to turn out the first time, and they're, 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 they're clearly a block. You know, Trump has done a good job of getting turn them out against him, and that's a block. You know, what I, you know, my humor, my laughing at Toby is, is only Democrats think that being, you know, passing more spending makes you the most consequential president in modern time. I would say Reagan's tax cuts, you know, saving the American, putting people putting money back in people's pockets makes you more consequential than spending their money. And, you know, President Trump had a huge tax cut, one of the largest we'd seen, you know, in a generation. That's very consequential, and that's the exact opposite of what Joe Biden runs on. Joe Biden runs on his successes. Look, I can spend all your money, and I think Donald Trump's going to run on the successes. Like, I'm going to give you your money back. So that's a good message. I a little bit of the world, and we'll go back to America. When I say go to America, I'm going to go back to America. Kalamazoo, Michigan, tako da se mogu ja hvaliti, tako da s time da se vraćamo kuće. Šta bi to značilo da Kina, osim verbalne podrške, počne i materijalno podržavati Rusiju? I think it's a very real possibility. It may even be happening as we speak, for all we know. Zato je pitam. Počelo se već dolažiti. It's a further... It's a further element of insecurity and bitterness in the bilateral relationship with the United States and with Europe mm -hmm. and with other parts of the world, in Asia, including oh in Asia, goodness. with Japan, with Korea. <clears throat> so it's hard to say what's going on with these, with these guys and women in Beijing. It's hard to say. I mean, they're, 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 they, 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 they seem to be at a point thawing their relationships and the hostilities. And I'm not saying they're all to blame, right? But um, we are very puzzled, and we do work in our firm with, with Chinese uh, uh, entities. You know, we're very proud of that. But in terms of the Chinese leadership, it's hard to say what's going on there. Što vam je to enigmatično? Što vam izgleda inkonsekventno? Što se mijenja? Ja kad gledam na politiku Kine posljednjih, recimo, pet godina, meni... To je zla obratno. Mislim da oni vrlo dosljedno zapravo zauzimaju što više polja, znate, ko u dječjim igrama, Afriku, pokušaju dominirati tehnološki, razvijaju vojno-militarne kompleksi i tako dalje, tako dalje. Mislim da to za vaše službe i vas nije uopće nepredvidljiva stvar. I would not proclaim their work in Africa a Chinese victory, by the way. I mean, we also do a lot of work in Africa. Correct. And, not, and the Africans are not that comfortable with the Chinese. Right. They'll take their money and let them build, like Kenya, for example. So they built the airport in Kenya for free. It's falling apart. I mean, the workmanship is not that great. The Chinese are not, you know, instantly loved when they get on the ground. And I don't think they're that imperialistic. I don't think they're trying to take over these places. I think they're trying to create a middle class wherever they can that will buy their stuff. Yeah, but, uh, u ovom dijelu svijeta se stalno govori Kina je tisuću puta veći protivnik SAD u ovom trenutku nego Rusije i tako da je tako da je. Kako vi zaista realno sad, jedan i drugi, i republikanci i amerikanci, doživljavate ovaj Kinu? Meni se ona zapravo ne čini 
toliko snažni protivnik, ko sve kad bi ih htjela biti protivnik SAD-u. Ja sam prije na strani Clintonove opaske, niko se nije obogatio koji se kladio protiv Amerike. I think you could make an argument. I think that's, I think that's a valid argument. The bellicosity mm -hmm. of Russia is clearly out there. I mean, the angry mother Russia, we are mad at the world. The Chinese don't give off that kind of vibe. No. The, their, the vibe for the Chinese, as far as we see, I think, and we're probably in agreement on this, is more, don't push us around, don't take advantage of us, uh, let's do business, don't interfere in our internal politics, don't tell us about human rights. But it's, it's more polite. <laughs> it's, more, it's, more, it's more of a civilized discussion, am I right? Yeah, yeah listen, it is a discussion uh, about uncivilized things, because we're talking about concentration camps right. in, in, in the western part of China. But, but I would say this, you know, China's involvement in Russia, you know, for them to escalate and provide weapons, going back to your original question, they'll be sanctioned immediately. Uh, Russia has seen some success as a result of the sanctions their economy has, has had, but they've suffered. I mean, you, you've had millions of people leave, the workforce leave. China wants to be a world superpower. It's very hard to be a world superpower where the, when most of the continents isolate you because you're making bad geopolitical decisions and choosing sort of a decaying, you know, uh, a decaying country, which is Russia. Uh, I don't think, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, you know, Ch China is, is trying to sort of maneuver its way in, in helping Russia because there's obviously, they'll probably gobble up, you know, Russia in, in 20 to, to, to 40 years. But uh, I, I think from the standpoint, you know, China has to be very careful uh, because they, they want to be a superpower. They want to have the, 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 they want their currency to be the value of the American's currency for economic reasons. That'll never happen to China if they get heavily involved in this, in this war in Ukraine and Russia. You, you, yeah. Europe will shut them out. Latin America will most certainly shut them out. The U.S. will shut out. So, I mean, so, so China is it's in a tough position. I don't see it making that decision. I could be wrong because the sanctions will be swift and they'll completely be dislodged from the international community, which China doesn't want. They want to be a part of the international community and say, our system is better. Look at how we're doing things. They don't want to be you know, a pariah in the international community and say, oh, by the way, our system is better. They, they want to win uh, on Western goals, and you can't win on Western goals by siding with Russia and by arming but, their But, you know, military. ultimately, and I think, I hope you would agree with this, Brian, ultimately, and this is slight, a slight disappointment as a Democrat mm -hmm. for me with Biden, <clears throat> we live in a world in Washington where the hostility toward the Chinese from the right to the left and back is totally complete in Congress. It is, it's almost unbelievable. Yeah. And over the past two years, while all this Ukraine stuff is going on, there's more hostility focused on the Chinese by the Republicans and the Democrats. And so, you know, one would hope in a, anything resembling a rational world a United States president would find ways to have some open channels and dialogue about things that concern us all, whether it's climate change or, or cyber, cyber security, to bi, you know? To bi, ali kako započeti, kako, kako <coughs> zaželjeti novog Nixona kad imate situaciju da zbog Tajvana odnos SNDA mm -hmm. i Kine može eskalirati? I'm, I'm telling, Romano, I'm telling you, the world that we live in, the climate, it's almost impossible. If Biden suddenly said, I'm going to resume the climate talks with the Chinese, we're going to take off tariffs, uh, we're not going to dwell on this or that issue internally in China, they, they would be both parties. Yeah. He'd be, he'd be impeached. Yeah. I think yeah. he'd be impeached. Yeah. The so there's no political is... space for the discussion. Mr. Dali, that's a spomenuto. to da bi uh, Brian, da bi uh, zbog Tajvana zaista mogao te sukob eskalirati u ratni sa Kinom. Mi, i, i, Sjeti, oprosite što uh, ja ovako olako postavljam tako grozna pitanja, ali znate, ovaj, ovaj svijet je potpuno no, poludio. Uh, svako ne su vijesti od jednom, znate, uh, NLO je <laughs> srušen i tako dalje. Dakle, sve se pretvorio ja. u, u, u javni diskurs u jednu nevjerovatnu, ovoga, kako da kažem, seriju zapravo. Ja. Ovoga, kao da gled, pratimo ne povijest, nego ja. nekakav reality show. It's unreal. It's, it's, it's... <laughs> Slažite se, yeah. vi ste yeah. također s televizije Well, I would, listen, yes. I'd say it's, it's important to realize a couple of things about Taiwan is, you know, its military has, what, 150,000 people. China's military sitting at, what, 2.5 million. I mean, it'll be overtaken in minutes 
uh, if it didn't have U.S. help. And that U.S. help isn't American troops. It's American weapons. It's sort of the, I, I view Taiwan as, as the porcupine strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, that if China were to invade, you know, uh, uh, Taiwan, they'd clearly take it over, but it'd be a tremendous price to take it over. I think that's the only strategy you have with something like, like Taiwan is yeah. for the international community to just to give it all it needs to just make it so painful for the Chinese that it's not worth the Chinese to take and I it think anymore. if you're the leadership of China and leadership of the Communist Party, what do you draw lesson-wise from Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Probably that any dream of quick victory is not really a, a valid dream. No, Blitzkrieg and victory is not a victory. Right. Tell me, to finish this with China, is it a very, very opake osobine, a to je Kina, Rusija, Iran. Oh, I think the axis exists. It's, it's, it's I think there. it's already there. Uh, it, I think the axis exists. I don't think China has taken the final step that Russia and Iran have taken to sort of be the horrible actors that those two are. I think they're, f they're forced with that decision. Uh, and they're they're going to evaluate it whether it makes sense or not. I mean, I think that's the danger of China is the fact that they're going to evaluate to join Iran and Russia in this coalition of the autocrats. Uh, I think that's, that's scary. Uh, but I think they, you know, they're not there yet. And hopefully, you know, Ukraine provides an example of why they shouldn't go there. Dakle, to pitam, naime, velike su konsekvence uvlačenja Irana u tu osovinu, onda i na Bliskom istoku. Tada to komplicira stvari odmah, dakle, po logici dominom efektom, tu je onda involviran i Izrael i tako dalje, i tako dalje. Well, that's true. Da. That's true. And the Netanyahu, this new coalition, you talk about things that destabilize, maybe not the whole world, but certainly a region, this new development with the uh, new coalition mm. is... Now, I'm an Arab, so I'm an Arab-American, so you have to take what I say with that perspective, but uh, I'm also a supporter of Israel. But, but this coalition can really bring Israel to its knees so that there will not, not be a Jewish state. It'll, there'll be a state, but it'll be dominated by Arab voters in 25 years. <laughs> Iz Washingtona, dakle, vidi, dakle, ovaj novi odnos, vaš novi odnos prema Evropskoj uniji. Naime, Trump je održao lekciju par puta, mi vas tu pokrivamo, noto, financiramo, vi trgujete s Rusima, dosta je toga i tako dalje, tako dalje. I olako se odjednom diže zapravo velika optužnica protiv Njemačke, još od vremena Angela Merkel. Do jučer je Merkel bila veliki državnik, posljednji veliki zapadni, evropski, liberal, demokratski državnik, bez obzira što je kršnjski demokrat. Ali odjednom ovoga je Angela Merkel krila svemu. Govori se o rekonfiguraciji zapravo odnosa u Evropi, o jačanju Poljske i tako dalje. Ajmo riječiti taj kompleks. Kako vi vidite odnose SAD-a i Evropske unije? The US-EU? Relations? No, no. Well, my, my former partner from a firm I was with before and one of my dear friends in life is the U.S. ambassador to the EU. And we are in touch with him. We talk to him. Uh, he said he was for formally under Obama. He was uh, ambassador to Romania. And he's happy to tell you the difference between representing the United States in a country like Romania or Croatia, wherever mm -hmm. it might be, and representing the U.S in an area where you have to get the approval of 27 countries. So that's the EU. So the, that's the balancing act that every day he has mm -hmm. and the U.S. has in trying, or any external force. Znate što se meni čini? Da je Trump najjasnije artikulirao, koliko god se Trumpa napadala, on je neke zapravo svoje politike vrlo pametno i jasno izrekao. Primjerice, on je vodi politiku prema Evropsku uniju upravo na tragu o kojem vi sad govorite, a to je... Igraću na kartu bilateralnih odnosa. Italiji ću ponuditi ovo. Imam za svakoga štap i mrkvu. A sa 27 zemalja je puno teže pregovarati. Tako da mi se čini da SAD u nekom trenutku zapravo ne želi snažnu Europsku uniju. Slažete se? Well, look what they went through to try to get the cap on the price of Russian oil. 
Da -da. Yeah. How many weeks and months oh and, and, and whether it's going to do any good or not, who knows? But, you know, the, the jury is out, as we say, right? Well, going to that, adding to the point and going to your question mm -hmm. about, you know, Trump and the EU and Trump and NATO, I, I think we're, we're, we're five years, six years from his statement or for his original statement about, about uh, NATO, and he proved to be right. You have Germans now who are saying we should not only meet our 2% minimum, it should be higher under a Green Party. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's something that you know, we, wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have seen. And, and I think history, you know, say what you want about Merkel, but history's not going to treat Merkel kind. Ali, uh, Br Bran, you know, the Republicans were a little bit Trump was ready to be a friend with Putin, and what are we going to do? But look, if it was at least a half of it, Pa zašto onda kriviti Njemce što čine najnormalniju stvar iz njemačke perspektive, to je zgrade Nord Stream 2 i žele ruski? Right, right. Vas dvojica da ste na čelu Njemačke radili bi isto. No, no, I'm not, I don't agree with Brian on Angela Merkel. No, listen, I think, listen, Trump's criticism of Nord Stream 2 was spot on. I think nobody can argue that that was a smart thing to do now. You know, we look at it now. You know, Trump's criticism of Merkel was spot on. I mean, you know, from him, you know, you have to understand sort of the, the, the America first policy is we're not going to let anybody rip us off anymore. And that means many things to many, to many people. But what it means to Trump is I don't like the EU partnering and hurting us. Mm -hmm. you know, I want to deal with them separately. That's why he was so, so thankful that uh, you had Brexit. Because ultimately he saw that as strengthening the U.S. trade power as opposed to weakening. It's a disaster, weakening. Brexit. Listen, that's a different conversation, but I'm saying what his model is is when he was looking at it. And I don't know if it's a disaster yet. Nije bio samo sretan, malo ga i poticao. Ne mislite? Well, it happened before, right. Well, Brexit happened before he was ever elected. No, but he was courting the Brexit guys. Nigel Farage. Yes, yes, Nigel. Kažite mi, ko je danas najbolji partner SAD-a u Evropi? Pitam to recimo u svijetu, recimo interpretacija da Amerika uzdiže Poljsku kao alternativu Njemačkoj i tako dalje, tako dalje. I would agree with that. I, I, think, I think Poland's become a good partner. It understands, mm -hmm. you know, what it means to be a leader in Europe. It understands the threat of Russia. It's always understood the threat of Russia. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's a country that's, that has been very receptive to the Ukrainian uh, refugees, which is, which is a good thing. And the U.S. has backfilled a lot of those, those finances. I think you still have the U.K., you have that special bond between those two countries. Only not in Europe. They're not in Europe. Yeah, that's true. How can you not say Europe? Yes, but, but, but why, is, why is the answer not Germany? Isn't that obvious? It has to be Germany. It should be. I don't know if it's obvious. I, I think it's obvious. I mean, if you don't have, if the solid bond between the U.S. and Europe is not anchored in Berlin, I think everybody's in trouble. Yeah, I think that. I don't know if you have any vision for American politics. Tell me. Sad nešto oprečno. Mi smo, Hrvatska jako ima u SAD-u jako veliku dijasporu i to bilo je nekoliko valova isiljavanja tamo još od druge polovice 19. stoljeća. Mi smo po broju mala zemlja ispod 4 miliona, nažalost. Kako vi u SAD-u danas doživljavate Hrvatsku ako ju uopće primjećujete na karti svijetu? So, it's a diaspora Like all diasporas, by the way, at least in our country, we can speak for our country. Most diasporas are disjointed, not organized. I mean, even they boast about the Armenian diaspora. Even in the Armenian diaspora, there's huge divisions, divisions and tribes, and you know, for coming oh, yeah. from Southern California. The Croatian diaspora, I think, is fairly united and effective. Um, there is a core of members of Congress that mm -hmm. belong to the Croatian caucus. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, past many years of accession into the EU has helped enormously with Croatia's bond with the United States, not just because it happened, but because of all the ancillary things and reforms that had to take place along the way. So, I, I mean, I'm very biased because I've been coming here for so long and, and, and working here and have such a warm spot in my heart for the country. But I, I don't think it's exaggeration to say it's a very special, has a very special place. But I think that in the last few years, in the last few years, it has happened 
nešto što možda i Hrvati dovoljno ne razumiju. Toliko su se toplili odnosi između SAD-a i Hrvatske, da ne samo da je ukrizno vizni režim, nego mi imamo jedan poseban status, dakle, ovaj LNG terminal na Krku je imao posebno geostrateško značenje. Exactly. Naša predsjednica prijašnja, dakle, Kolinda Grabar-Kitarović, kad i kad govorila, kad se nije razumjelo što bi to zapravo značilo u Poljskoj staviti jedan dolje na Krku, da je u drugi, tako dalje, tako dalje. Dakle, And one, you know, one the of the bond is getting stronger. Definitely. One of the reasons we're here is for mm -hmm. a department, U.S. Department of Energy, yeah. Atlantic Council conference that's taking that's place. Yeah, that's, that's, that's taking place. Take, no, so one of the the underlying sort of challenge of the conference is for the United States to pay more attention to Croatia as a place where future Putin-like aggression <clears throat> is much less likely to take place. Right. So to encourage entrepreneurs here to uh, they're now on the path for the double taxation treaty with the US Dutch which is very very important Dutch right Dutch it's amazing that it hasn't happened yet but it's it's it will happen so I think geopolitically it's not like Croatia is out way out in the borderland somewhere it's right in the path of what could be either great great successes and prosperity or big problems as we you know as we unfortunately saw in the early 90s da. Recite mi, sad rekao sam da ćemo se vratiti kuće. Kad sad gledam vas dvojicu, osim ovog ugodnog ipak gospodskog diskutiranja, koje je i šarmantno kad se malo evo kao poriječkate, vi ste dva džentlmena, dakle gospoda koji se normalno razgovarate i nema tih tenzija. U čemu je zapravo sukob? Gdje je taj veliki jaz između demokrata i republikanaca? Danas, ne mislim tradicionalno. U čemu se, odgovorit ćete i jedan i drugi, evo recimo prvo vi, u čemu je... Ne, 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 And I can only tell you from my side what my, pe my, my, my people think it is. From, <clears throat> even though Reagan is a hero in Republican circles. And in the world. Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe. We're in Europe. Maybe. But, 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 but our view is that from 64, when Goldwater was nominated to be president and was soundly defeated, a historic defeat, through... Nixon, who was, I, we thought, was a good president, but for Watergate, um, but basically a smart guy and a smart policy guy. Then Reagan, then Bush Sr., then, <clears throat> and, then, and then, of course, the takeover of Congress in 94 by the Gingrich and then in 2010. They don't believe in governing. They don't believe in governing. And in our view, if you just have unbridled capitalism and no governmental structure, you're, you're, you're finished. And that, in my view, and now, Brian will give you his opinion, which could be entirely different. I think it will be. But my, our view on our side is they don't believe in governing. All they want to do is rip government, government down. So. Uh, to je loše kad se počinje tako sumnjati, a vidjeli smo i realno u, u institucije. Kakav je vaš odgovor? Yeah, listen, yeah, I, it, it's, it's interesting that, that Toby sort of brings up um, you know, Goldwater. That's when the Republican Party you know, became conservative. You know, before it was a big government, you know, big spending, big tax, big government party. You know, Goldwater you know, leaned out to the West and became more conservative than small government. The government should do, do very little, get out of the way for people's imaginations, creativity, to let them thrive, uh, except they believe a strong military and obviously strong law enforcement. I don't think that's the division. I, you know, I, I truly think the division of where we are and why the gap's just going to get bigger and bigger is, is media. It's, it's cable huh. television. It's, it's the fact that you reward bad, antagonistic, provocative yeah. behavior. Yes. Broadcast TV doesn't do that. You don't get on TV if you're going to say dumb things. Maybe you get on TV because you said something dumb and they're covering that. You can get on Fox and say... Yeah, but that's broadcast. Mm. Or that, Fox is cable. I'm talking about broadcast. And broadcast mm. is a little bit more serious. On cable, they put anybody on. MSNBC puts whatever crazy you can find on the street. Fox mm. puts whatever crazy... And people say to me, yeah. do you miss Congress? 
No. Would you like no to way. be there? And the first thing I say is, I would never, ever run for office or serve as much of an honor as it is with social media there. Mm -mm. Never. I, I look at what my friends are going through, both, both parties. Yeah. To deal with social media oh. and the <clears throat> hatred and the bitterness and the hostility toward public servants, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So I think my, my view, I think the division is only going to get worse the more and more sort of fragmented the media becomes. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, the Trump era sort of exposed how mainstream media is not as clean or as, as, as good as, 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 as other people would like to see. And so you've seen it bleed into, into mainstream media now. You know, you have mainstream media that offers opinions when they used to just offer facts. I think it's only going to get worse, but I think it's the cableization of our media which is, which is driving the biggest divide. And social media. Because you're rewarding, yeah, you're, you're rewarding bad behavior. Yeah. And that never happened before. Eskalirati, idemo prema kraju emisije, pa dođe ćemo s Ukrajinom, ali samo moram kazati, doće eskalirati sad ovom izbjerom, još i više čujem da Trump priprema reality show kao glavnu zapravo strategiju kampanje. Mislim, to je fantastično. Sanu stranu zapravo svega zamislio prije jedno deset godina. Da američki predsjednik ima zapravo kao glavni adut kampanja reality show. Look, people in, people in democracies all over the world are going to have to learn no. how to make their decisions without, without uh, falling prey to these conspiracy theories and <laughs> this garbage. If you look at where most people are getting their news from, it's not a pretty picture. No, it's biti, not news outlets. Right. Biće to dug put sada zapravo ovoga vratiti u tubu, znate, stisnu tu pastu, jer <laughs> stvar je otišla predaleko sa tim ludostima u, u, u društvenim mrežama i, 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 i inače, pa čak i u mainstreamu. Tu smo na jedno 3-4 minuti pred kraj emisije. Moram vas jednog drugog pitati, jer to je ipak središnje pitanje ovog svijeta ovom trenutku. Je li mu uopće možete konceptualizirati i zamisliti kraj ovog rata u Ukrajini? Kako ga zaustaviti i kakav bi bio fer ishod toga? Well, you heard me earlier in the program. Um, probably not a popular opinion because so many people are rah, rah, let's go to victory. I think that's not happening. No. And I think the facts on the ground will ultimately create a result that is not up in a banner somewhere, is not in lights, but it will be the reality on the ground. And it will look something like Korea. That's my view. Yeah, oh. listen, Ukraine is not going where we want it to go. I, I think, oh. you know, you, you had, it's just, it's, it, you, you'll see what the offensive Ali, looks like. From, uh, uh, za jednog i za drugog, samo jedna opaska. Ja to radim već dovoljno dugo da moramo kazati. Ja sam to u jednom misli nazvao najgorim mogućim ishadom. I nazvao sam to zapravo uh, uh, bleeding wound. Na, uh, mm. Da, imate cipar koji je desetljećima tako podijeljen. Aha. Znate, to ne moramo zamisliti dvije Koreje koje su posve oprečne i tako da konfrontirane i zapravo dva račita potpuno svijeta, ne? Ali to je bilo možda trajne krvareće rješenje u, u zamisliti Ukrajinu ta, na taj način. Ali svijet nije savršeno, možda će biti zaista tako. Recite, brad. Yeah, no, listen, I, I would say, you know, we're not gonna see, you know, we'll know in the next couple months with the Ukrainian offensive to see what ultimately changes more dynamics on the ground. But I think Toby's right. I mean, we're going to we're just going to see a flood of weapons from all sides uh, and people are just going to be stuck in the ground. And you know, we'll, we'll probably be here. You know, I'm sure we'll be here a year from now having the same conversation as what well, can we do to end the war in Ukraine? Uh, you know, as long as Putin's willing to destroy his country to occupy Ukraine, we're going to be in here a long time because I don't see it. As, you know, Zelensky wants Crimea back. I don't see, you know, Zelensky getting Crimea back. So if he's not going to get Crimea back, we're in perpetual war for until that happens. And that's just not going to happen. Yeah. And if I'm right, and if it is a Korea-like situation, then the contest will be to rebuild Ukraine in a, in a Western image in Putin's face, oh. even though he may still be on the ground in Luhansk and Donetsk. To neće biti tako teško, mislim, mi ovdje u ovoj tijelu Evrope imamo, znate, pamćenje još ipak iz vremena Count kao monarhije i tamo su mnogi gradovi pripadali Zapadnoj Evropi, pre imaju tu kulturu, tako da neće to biti tako teško. Uz 
naše mašine. Hvala vam lijepo što ste bili moji gosti. Bilo je izuzetno ugodno. Nadam se da ćete inače na vašim putovanjima u Europu sračati u Zagreb, pa ovo vrata su u ove televizije uvijek otvorena. Hvala lijepo. Rijetko je to, ali vi ste služujete da proširim broj gostiju. Hvala vam lijepo, budite s nama i sljedećeg utorka. Do tada, doviđenja i svako dobro.